welcome to this episode of Lucid Living with Brie, Learn to Live in Love Awake. I am your host, Brie Walta, and today we have Margot Groenay, licensed professional counselor in Virginia who focuses on trauma, here to talk to us about EMDR. Welcome, Margot. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Me too. Me too. I'm I'm so excited for this topic because like we were chatting before we started recording, EMDR is, it's a term now that people are like familiar with. They've heard it. Maybe they've had a friend who's done it. Or maybe they've done it. But like, I think people throw around the term and I get asked this a lot with cl- prospective clients. They're like, is it similar to EMDR? <laughs> I'm like, I, I mean, sort of, but like not, they're all their own unique thing. Um, yeah. so yeah. I love, I've, I've loved having you, or I do love having you right now on the podcast to talk about what it actually is. Yeah. It's, I mean, even when I was getting trained in it, I was like, what is this magical thing people keep talking about? And I was like, okay, yeah. Like they offered me one of the sites I was working at was like, we need someone trained in EMDR. It's really great. Will you do it? And I just said, yes. Cause I heard all this buzz about it, yeah. not really even fully understanding what I would be embarking on the next <laughs> few months during that training process. Um, yeah. but it was wonderful and it's, it's so cool. And the more I work with it, I think I've been trained now for a little over two years. Um, and it's, it's just like, it's really fun. It's different. And I can totally explain it, talk about it whenever we're ready for that. Yeah. Yeah. I want to start with just, we're going to get into all the nitty gritty and like scientific pieces too, but like if you had to explain it to a third grader, like how, what is the most simplest way to describe EMDR? Okay. So if I was going to explain it to a third grader, I would say, okay, sometimes when we experience things that are really traumatic, the thinking part of our brain goes offline Mm -hmm. and just the survival part of our brain is there. And when we're in survival mode, we don't really make a lot of decisions and we base a lot of our, um, fight, flight, or freeze on the environment that's around us. And then we encode that, right? So we take that memory and we put it in a file. And then our body likes to be really effective and not think as much as possible, right? So our brains are trying to be like as chillaxed as possible. So as we go through life, anytime our body feels that way again, instead of thinking through and reassessing the situation, it takes that little file and puts it back on on like kind of the play and we re-experience it. Yeah. And so we end up re-experiencing a really traumatic experience many times throughout our life. And our body actually becomes hypervigilant or super focused to see that pattern throughout the rest of our life. And so if you don't take care of it, when it first happens, we end up re-experiencing trauma a lot more than we really have to. That's how I would tell a third grader about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's really that experience of you know, something traumatic happened, it encoded in your body. And then when it happens thereafter, your body responds the same way, right? Like you might get the, the nausea or the pit in your stomach or the lump in your throat, and you don't necessarily have the verbal understanding of why, why, why this is happening. Correct. Correct. And I say our body is kind of like always sensing things. And so whenever our body starts to sense that it's in the same environment, it cues it up the same response. Yep. yep. Right. So that's what makes it really hard is we don't even get the opportunity to reassess the situation yeah. when we've experienced trauma and we haven't worked through it. Yeah. And it's automatic, right? It's like we are in, I like the term like hijacked by the trauma because we don't stop and say, oh, this, this thing is happening. I'm going to pull from this trauma, this experience that's familiar. And then I'm going to feel this in my body. It's just like stimulus response. Like, it's just like, like you said, the file that gets pulled off of the, the back of our brain. That's like, we know what this is. Here we go. Uh, Yeah. And I think like trauma gets a really bad rap. Um, Our brain is really trying to keep us safe as quick and fast as possible. And our brain is always going to, we're designed, humans are designed for survival. And so your brain thinks it's being really helpful by pulling that track off the record Mm -hmm. (laughs) and putting it on play because it really does believe that you're in a dangerous situation. The problem is most of us are not again. And so we just kind of want to recode the system a little bit and say, Hey, 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 that's actually not very common. It's not, it's hopefully not going to happen again. And this is how we can take care of it. Yeah. 
And to your point about efficiency, like our, it's so cool that our brains have all of these ways to like save our energy and to help us just <laughs> move. About. And some of them are, you know, maladaptive, but, right. but really it takes less energy to live in the default pattern, to live in what, you know, which is why when you start doing introspective work, it can feel so fucking exhausting because you have to use so much more intentionality and brain power and, and just drive to pick up the sled and move it to a new part of the sledding hill so that you can go down a different path. Yep. Yep. And EMDR is different than some other trauma modalities. It's actually a three pronged approach. So it's past, present and future. Okay. Which I really like. Cause a lot of times in talk therapy, you're just looking at present and past Yeah. And we're really even covering the anticipatory anxiety about the future. Right. Yeah. And yeah. creating a, um, like a path for the future in our brain, which is the, my favorite part of EMDR. Mm-hmm. Okay. So tell us, tell us how, how that works and what that looks like in, in a session. And also what does EMDR stand for? <laughs> For people okay. who don't know, EMDR stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Okay. So EMDR is a therapeutic modality that's got a lot of evidence behind it. Um, and it's a manualized treatment. And I like to really be big on that because a lot of therapists struggle to stay true to the protocols. So manualized treatment means we actually have a manual and we go through certain protocols each session. Um, and there's different protocols for different things. Some therapists get really like, I don't know, wonky with it and they do their own thing. And I'm like, let's just stick to the science. Yeah. And also why I say that for all of you guys is it's super regulating to know what to expect when you go into therapy. Yeah. Right. And when you're going through EMDR with a therapist, it's really nice to know, okay, I'm going to go in and this is what the session's going to look like. And this is what we're going to do. And this is how it's going to end. And then this is what we're going to do next time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And um, so I will even talk about like, there's eight phases. There's history and treatment planning. There's preparation, assessment, desensitization, installation, body scan, closure, reevaluation. So those are the eight phases and that doesn't all happen in one session. Okay. But the D stands for desensitization. So what that means is eye movement in the EMDR, eye movement means we're using eye movements to create bilateral stimulation. And I go like this because that's kind of what your eyes are doing. Yeah, so back so, and forth for people that aren't watching. Forth, yep. Right. <laughs> Back and forth and back, you would do it with one finger, but I like the windshield yeah. wiper effect yeah. better. Um, and so what that means is we're using some type of bilateral stimulation by meaning two, right? So two, we're activating both hemispheres of the brain, mm-hmm. right? So we're activating both hemispheres of the brain to create the physiology that your body had at the time. So to create in your body, the experience that you were having during the time of a memory, of a traumatic memory, in a closed contained space, right? You are safe. You're with a therapist. So you're kind of taxing your brain, right? Mm -hmm. To cue up this memory so that your body's also processing because we're going to be processing through the body. And we first desensitize. This is very important. We're desensitizing the traumatic memory. So some therapists, if you come in to do EMDR, they'll say, let's start with some EMD, eye movement desensitization, because the traumatic memory is so triggering that we can't possibly even work on it until we get it down a little bit. Mm-hmm. And this I do with people even after like um, like a global globally traumatic event or mm-hmm. really bad news, right? We don't know maybe what's going to happen in the future, but it's so triggering at the moment that like, yeah. let's just take it down a notch, Right. So if you're coming in and you're saying it's 10 on a unit of distress, let's just take it down before we start to reprocess. So that can be its own protocol, but it's also part of EMDR. And then the R stands for the reprocessing, right? So we want to reprocess the memory with a positive belief about yourself. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes traumatic memories are encoded in our body with a negative belief about ourself. So not only do we re-experience that trauma every time our body senses it, we also start to tack on different experiences that reinforce that negative belief about ourself. Yeah. That are very 
they are very young statements typically because our first trauma is usually very young. So it's something like, I am bad. I am powerless. I am responsible. I'm not safe. Those are typically what we would see. Mm -hmm. I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The shame. Kind of at the crux, right? Yeah. So that's kind of at the crux of it. So then the reprocessing means we take that memory, we take the units of distress down, which means you're still going to have emotions and big feelings about it as you should, but it means your body doesn't respond to it, right? My body no longer responds when I cue that memory up. And then I'm able to reprocess it with a more effective belief about myself. Like I am okay. I have choices now. I'm safe. My body's okay. Right? So a positive belief. And then once that's fully installed, we would say once that's like the truest it can possibly be, you've successfully reprocessed that traumatic memory. So that's what EMDR session treatment planning is kind of like in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Questions, comments, like that was a lot of it for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, and I'm I'm just thinking the parallels to tapping. So I use EFT tapping. So if I'm understanding correctly, the desensitization uh, process or portion is more of the like nervous system regulating where you're using the body, you're using this, the bilateral stimulation to signal to the body that we're safe, even though we're going to bring up this thing that causes a lot of feeling, a lot of emotion. Yep. Okay. And I would say, yes. So we use a SUD scale. So the u- yeah. subject units of distress, right? Yeah. And so the SUD is a zero. A zero means the body is calm. It doesn't mean you have no emotion about it. And I'm always very clear with my clients on that. And they're like, it's still a five. And I'm like, but you look like you're calm right now. Yeah. <laughs> They're like still very disturbing. I was like, of course it's disturbing as it should be. That's a disturbing memory. But how does your body feel right now? And they're like, oh yeah. Okay. Maybe it's a two. I'm like, great. Yeah. Where's the two? The somatic, the somatic feeling is so hard for us to like, it's just a new, it's a new thing to focus on if we're in our head a lot of the time, or if we're escaping because we don't want to be in our head. We're like outside of our mind and our body. So yeah. to ask somebody like, what is your body feeling mm-hmm. is sometimes hard for, or, or takes practice for people to be able to close your eyes and drop in and be like, okay, I'm feeling some tension in my chest. I'm feeling a little bit of unease in my stomach, right? Like right. those types of feelings. Right. And part of the preparation work in one of those phases of EMDR is making sure that people are connected to their bodies. Cause oftentimes in trauma, we disconnect. And again, that's a survival skill. It's not that it's right or wrong. It's a survival skill. When things are too painful for your body that you disconnect, that is, that's your only skill at that time. Okay. So we have to work on reconnecting to ourselves, to our bodies, locating emotions and feelings, what that feels like, how to how to explain that to somebody else before yeah. you can be ready to do EMDR. Yeah. Yes. That piece for my clients too, when we, when we set up tapping, we do the same, same thing, the body scan, we, we choose the subjective units of distress of, you know, my three might be someone else's eight, but it doesn't, doesn't matter because it's only for my, my, uh, um, can't think of the word being able to see if it goes up or down. Right. Um, but having them drop into their body it for some, again, for somebody who never has done that before. And you're like, what are you feeling in your body? And they're like, I don't know. Like, I just want to normalize that for people. If you're like, what the fuck are they talking about? <laughs> like, drop into your body. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I always, I like to ask some questions, right. Of like, I'm always very curious when I'm doing EMDR with someone and I'm like, okay, if they're like, I feel nothing. I was like, okay, tell me, is it numb or is it neutral? Yeah. Which one is it? Because there's a big difference between two. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times we dissociate when we go through traumatic things. That's normal, right? Dissociation is a continuum. And at some level we all do it. Okay. Is dissociation encoded in this memory? Okay. Let's look at it. That's yeah. there's no right or wrong. Yeah. Yeah. With women that I've talked to you who, who have dissociation as the like reflex, they have, in my experience, even more shame around this coping mechanism that comes in when they dissociate and then they come back during session. And they're like, I can't believe I just did that again. Like I just left my body. Like, it's almost like they failed at it. And it's like, Oh, sweetie, like your, your, your mind and your body are taking over in this experience that, you know, is feeling activating for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you, is, is somebody with dissociation, a good candidate for 
EMDR or sort of what does that look like as you're trying to help them come into the body? Yeah. There's so many different thoughts and ideas on that. Some people will say no. Some people will say yes. I believe dissociation is a result of trauma. So I would say absolutely. However, making sure that we know what parts of you are coming to session and what parts we're going to be working on and looking at how much distress can you handle before I call it like you slip away, you take yeah. a break. You take a time out, right? And so that we can contain our sessions mm -hmm. so that you can stay here, right? And that unit of, or like that, you know, like window of tolerance, it grows with time, but it also shrinks, right? With trauma. Mm -hmm. And so looking at, okay, how do we grow that so that you can stay and do that work together? And then, right, working on staying here longer and knowing that you can tolerate it now. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an important point to really like drive home is that your, your capacity to sit in discomfort, right. This window of tolerance is something that can be widened for if sure. You, if you have a very short, we'll call it a fuse, right. Of like, you don't have a lot of tolerance for something that's uncomfortable or triggering without you reflexively leaving your body or having another sort of trigger that is automatic in your system you can tone that you can, you can work with it to expand it by creating safety in the nervous system mm -hmm. over and over and over again. Right. This is like right. a continual process of coming back into safety with your body. Right. And women or anyone that experiences any trauma is more likely to re-experience trauma. So yeah. it makes sense that people that are coming to us are going to have a small window of tolerance mm -hmm. and not be in their optimal level of functioning most of the time. That's again, not good or bad. It just is. Let's look at what we need to do. Do some resourcing. That's a big part of EMDR too, is like, what resources do we have available? Who's a safe person for you? Mm -hmm. What's a safe place for you? Before we even start reprocessing, we create a safe, calm place, which I really love. And it's kind of this visualization mm -hmm. um, of a place you can go in your mind at any time when you feel like you want to get away, yeah. right? And so it's learning to go internal instead of like kind of slipping out, right? And making this internal safe space. We do that and we create that and we test it to make sure that it actually works. And then that's a resource that people have for the rest of their lives, right? The safe, calm place, not just in the context of EMDR. Yep. Yeah. And I love at the end of EMDR, at least in my, my personal experience with it, it's like, can we put this like in a box on a shelf that we're going to revisit, which is such a... Like, I don't, to me at first it was so silly. I'm like, I don't want to put this in a box on a shelf. <laughs> like I want this to go away, but it helped, it helped for the in-between time of session to not feel like so open and exposed. Yeah. Yeah. I always tell people, I'm like, okay, envision an actual like box that you have. I had one client be like, okay, it's a Nike box and it's orange. <laughs> I'm like, that's fine. Does it have a lid? Like, yes. I was like, great. <laughs> we'll yeah. use it. The Nike box, put it in there. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. That's so good. When you were going through your training was, what was the most like surprising piece of the experience for you? Just as someone who was like, didn't know what she was in for more or less. Yeah, it was so intense. So EMDR, my training was 48 credit hours and we did it over, I think it was three weekends. And then you have like six months, I think after where you practice EMDR and then you come back each month and do consultation. And so mm -hmm. it would be like three days back to back of training. Um, and we'd sit and lecture and then we'd practice on each other in our groups and you had to participate in one, conduct one, and then observe one. So it was kind of that triune model of yeah. um, see one, do one, teach one type of thing. Yeah. Um, and we all did our, our own stuff. And so I'm with strangers that I didn't know. I got very close with them clearly because we're working on some traumatic memory that you have in your life and we're participating in it with one another. And part of my personal experience was you put it in the box on the shelf, but your body's still processing because your body doesn't know therapy's over or the session's over or I'll come back next weekend or next yeah. month. And so I had, I would sweat in my sessions because my body was working so hard, which I thought was very interesting. I'm like, wow, I feel like I just got out of like a hit fitness class, yeah. but really I've just been doing therapy. 
And that I would feel so exhausted afterwards. It was like this big release. And then I would have very vivid dreams. They were not nightmares. They were just very vivid dreams because I think there was different parts of my brain that were stimulated that hadn't been in a while. Yeah. And yeah. so I remember I would like look forward to my dreams that night and be like, I wonder what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. um, and it was like, it was really cool. It was a really, really cool experience. And it opened up a lot for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And talk a little bit about, I think people have a fear factor around EMDR of like, oh my God, this is going to be like so much and so intense and all my biggest, worst things I never want to look at are going to come out and I'm not going to be able to handle it. Mm -hmm. So talk about how EMDR is, a, it it's supportive more so than something to be afraid of. Yes. So the cool thing about EMDR is like, as the therapist, I'm there with you the whole time and you are kind of running the show. And what we're looking for is any type of movement, any either way. So if the units of distress are going down or up, or if the, pos the validity of the positive cognition is going down or up, we're just looking for movement because that means things are changing. Um, and so with EMDR, you're using bilateral stimulation and you're focusing on an image, an emotion, and a, and a body sensation of that emotion and a negative belief about self mm -hmm. and you're kind of going through it and you yourself are being like an investigator of like what's going on inside of me what's changing and you can give as much feedback as you like or as little feedback as you like in between the sets and so you do bilateral stimulation for about 30 seconds a minute depending on the person which means you're quiet you're in yourself and we do shorter if someone has a higher risk of dissociation. And we do longer if they have a lower risk of dissociation, right? Yeah. Shorter if they're a fast processor, longer if they're a slow processor, right? You yeah. learn that with your therapist. And then I ask you, okay, what's happening now? Or what's coming up for you now? And you get to choose how much or how little you say. And then I just tell you, go with that right? Go with whatever's coming up. So sometimes someone will just look at me and be like a lot. I'm like, can you go with that? And if they say yes, they go. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of like a dance, right? I have to know you and trust you and you have to know and trust me, mm -hmm. trust me that I'm not going to push you past where you can tolerate and where you can go. Trust that things are changing. I have to trust that like you're in it. You're staying with it. You're not just sitting there and just telling me, yes, no, yes, no. Right. You're involved in this process too. And we do it together. Mm -hmm. So sometimes a lot of things change. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes we work on one memory in one session and it's done. Sometimes it's six sessions, seven sessions. It depends on the memory. It depends on the person. Yeah. Uh, and I kind of will go back into how I explain EMDR too is we start with a touchstone memory. And so I always use a hand as like a memory. So you have a touchstone memory and then you have feeder memories. So there are all these other memories that are linked to the touchstone memory because like we said in that example, right? Like that's, that's the cassette player. And I'm using like a cassette. I don't know why, but it just <laughs> seems easier because like an iPod doesn't work for this, yeah. you know, yeah. this, this example. So it's like, if it's a cassette, Every time your body feels that same feeling, it puts the cassette back in, right? So it links to this touchstone and it creates a new memory, mm -hmm. right? And so when we're reprocessing, it doesn't matter what memory you come in with, they're all linked. So yeah. we're going to work on all of them. Yeah. Not just one. And it's like, it doesn't matter which one we start with. So maybe it's not the first initial experience, where you were potentially, you know, sexually assaulted by someone or molested when you were a child. Maybe we don't start with that. Yeah. That is big and scary. Okay. But maybe we start with the boyfriend you had in college that just made you feel really uncomfortable. Yeah. And didn't respect your boundaries and you don't know why it still bothers you. Maybe yeah. we start with that right? And we see what comes up because we trust that given the chance, the body is always going to move toward healing. Yeah. Yeah. So. I love that. I love just the permission, even that you don't have to jump into the biggest, scariest, the deep end, right? It's like, 
And and that goes along with building trust with your practitioner also, or your therapist. It's like, we don't want to, we don't want to re-traumatize something by jumping into something that's not, not feeling safe and contained. Right. And finding the right practitioner is also a thing. So Mm -hmm. just for people listening, like if you've maybe attempted EMDR and you haven't experienced like what Margo is saying right now you can shop around, right? You can date around and find the right therapist that works for you. (laughs) Yes. Find the right therapist. If anything, you want to make sure you trust that person that you are comfortable and that you trust their skill set, and you like their vibe and what they're bringing and their energy, because you are opening up a big part of you. And I like to say, when you start EMDR, you might think you're just working on one issue and it might end up being a lot longer process because it does work. And you, and you realize like, wow, this is so effective and I'm getting a lot of positive benefits from it. So maybe I thought I was just going to work on, let's say the sexual assault from when I was a child. And then I end up working on, you know, vulnerability issues or power issues, a power dynamic, right? Maybe there's other things that I'd actually like to work on as well. And I want to stick with the the provider I trust and, and like. Yeah. And what I often see is my clients that do EMDR with me will do, we'll commit to EMDR on a certain issue, right? And then we'll take a little break and we'll do some talk therapy, mm-hmm. air therapy work. And then they're like, okay, I'm ready to get back into it. I'm like, okay, let's pick the new thing. And yeah. so you also can have that kind of relationship with your provider as well. Yeah. That was my experience when I did EMDR with my very first therapist. Like I was so disconnected from my body and had a lot of just unacknowledged even issues from childhood. I was like, childhood was pretty great. Like, I don't know, you know, and there was so much, you know, underneath. And in our sessions, I remember prior to that experience, like not really having the experience of crying or being like, I felt releases with EMDR that I hadn't up to that point. And I was like, oh, this is like unlocking. Yeah pieces of my body and like releasing through emotion, which sometimes we're scared of emotion, especially if we haven't had experience of feeling it. Um, but that was for me, like a very transformative piece of EMDR. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's different for everybody. Yeah. And before, just so everybody knows, if you're scared of EMDR, that's okay. You can ask a lot of questions. You're ideally going to do a lot of prep work with your therapist. That's That's the number one step, right? Is the treatment planning of EMDR. It's also like asking questions. It's looking at, again, what are your resources, right? What support system do you have? What's your background? Let me do an assessment for dissociation. Let me do an assessment for other disorders, right? What medications are you on? All of that, right? We're going to look at a lot of different things before we even get to opening up because you want to have that bond, Mm-hmm. And that therapeutic alliance with your therapist. And like, I would say like, if they're not the right fit, they're not the right fit. Don't push yourself. There are enough therapists and providers and practitioners out there. Find someone that you feel comfortable with. Yeah. This is not the place to push yourself. This is, this is not the place to people, th- people please your therapist. Literally. I always tell people at the end of my session, like it was lovely meeting you. If you want to work together, great. And if I'm not for you, please let me know. You won't hurt my feelings, but let me help you find someone that will work for you. Right. Because we're all different and unique. We need different and unique therapists as well. Yeah. Yeah. And the process to find a therapist, like I just, I, I know there are some things coming online that help like search engines and things for specific therapists, but still, I even have friends because I spent so long in the, the mental health and addiction field friends will reach out to me and be like, do you know a therapist that would be good for this? And I have a whole spreadsheet that I share with people. And um, because even going on one of those search platforms seems so daunting that when you do find one, you're like, I need this one to work because I just can't, I can't keep dating. Like, I need- <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and I always tell people, like, if you reach out to someone that you just know it's, you think it's going to be a good fit and they have a wait list, ask them, tell them, be like, I can't wait. I need to get in immediately. Do you have anyone that you recommend that's like you? Because I have people in my, you know, like in my circle that are very similar to my style that yeah. might have openings when I don't. And we kind of refer back and forth. Right. Oh, exactly. Always worth asking. Most therapists are happy to help. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. So give us, give us an example so people can kind of wrap their head around what maybe an issue is coming into EMDR and then what a session, what it, what it looks like. Okay, great. So the example I typically use when I'm teaching about EMDR is let's say I have a woman in her thirties and she's coming to me. And I like to use this example because it's, we think that EMDR has to be this super big thing. It doesn't have to be. It can be for any kind of heightened response that's not making sense to you. So mm -hmm. let's say it's a woman in her thirties. She has a male boss and she comes and she's like, I really struggle with getting feedback from my boss. It, it puts me on edge. I feel very uncomfortable. I feel like heightened sense of anxiety. And I feel like I go into fight or flight, right? Yeah. I start sweating through my clothes and it's, it's really impairing my ability to work in this environment, to do my job. Right. So if something's impairing your ability to function, that means it's a, it could be of clinical significance, right? So anything in life that's impairing your ability for relationships, for work, for school, or for social activities, that means it could be a clinical issue. So come on in yep. <laughs> to be like this big, big thing. And so let's say we start doing a, um, a treatment plan with her, or I start doing, taking some history and we look at, okay, so she tells me that she gets this heightened response. And so I might say, well, when have you felt that way before? Right. Do a little float back. Maybe she comes up with stuff. Maybe she doesn't. But the example I use is, okay, let's say this same girl, she was three or four years old and she was eating breakfast and she spills her cereal and milk all over the table. And her dad goes ballistic right? He's yelling, he's screaming, right? He's like, you're so dumb. How could you do that? You need to be more careful. Like what is wrong with you, right? He's having this total meltdown and inappropriate emotional response to something that happened, right? A three or four-year-old spilled her milk. Yeah. Expected to happen. But as a three and four-year-old, you don't understand my dad's really stressed at work. He's emotionally explosive he is, you know, not regulating his emotions, right? Like there's something wrong here as a three or four year old. You think I made this happen. This is my fault because we don't yet understand how things happen, right? We think we are the cause of everything. So we interpret this feeling of, right? Like the startle response of someone yelling at us with a negative belief. I'm bad. Mm -hmm. Right. So, okay. That happens. That's one incident. Well, she goes on her way a couple years later, she's in sixth grade and she's playing soccer. She misses a goal and her coach goes ballistic S male coach starts yelling at her screaming. Are you stupid? What's wrong with you? You're letting everyone down. You're letting me down, right? Like has this total, like again, meltdown and her body immediately thinks, oh my gosh, when have I felt this way before? And it keeps up that memory from when she was a little kid, puts it on play and is like, I'm bad. I'm wrong. I'm stupid. Right. Reinforces it. Reinforces it. So, right. We would have the touchstone memory is when she's three and she spills her milk. Now we've got one feeder memory playing mm -hmm. soccer. Okay. Then let's say she's in college, she's dating and, um, she doesn't text her boyfriend. She comes home, you know, late to his house or her dorm room. And he's there. And he's like, I've been waiting for you all day. What is wrong with you? How dare you do that? You don't, you know, respect my time and my energy and everything I do for you. And her body immediately goes back into, <gasps> right? Someone's yelling at me. She's yeah. going into the hypervigilant state and it cues up the oldie but goodie memory, right? Yeah. I'm bad. I'm wrong. I'm stupid, right? So now her body is constantly, we've got right two memories linked and the touchstone. So now mm -hmm. she's in her thirties, she's working anytime her boss gives her feedback or he starts to raise his voice, right? Let's yeah. say that the boss isn't yelling at her. He starts to raise his voice. Her body is hypervigilant and thinks, oh my gosh, we know this, right? The body scans and says, it looks like, it feels like, it must be like, mm -hmm. that's what your body's always doing. Looks like, feels like, must be like, and it cues up that memory. So anytime someone raises their voice and creates that environment, her body starts to pick it up. It cues up that memory. I'm bad. I'm wrong. I'm stupid. Right? So yeah. she could come to me and say like, this is what's going on. We might do a nice memory track or a treatment plan, or we, we call it a float back, right? Cueing up that feeling and seeing when a time, 
You might have felt that way before. And we get back to this three-year-old memory maybe, or maybe we don't, because sometimes we don't have explicit memory from when we're that young. Maybe she remembers the soccer coach. Yeah. She's like, you know what? This is so weird. This is what people always say. This is so weird. And I don't know why I'm thinking this, but yeah. and the, the memory now, I'm like, it's not weird. Your body knows if it yep. came up, it's linked. Let's go with it. And so yeah. maybe we start off with that, right? And we effectively, we would want to do like, we would want her to be able to think about that soccer memory, get it down where it's not disturbing anymore in her body, right? Like her body can be calm. And then we probably want to install a positive belief with that memory that says like, I'm good. I'm okay. Mm-hmm. Or I'm normal, right? Yeah. I'm okay with how I am. Yeah. And then other things would start to either effectively link to that positive belief, or we'd bring up other memories by themselves and reprocess them. That's the example I like to use. No, I love that because it's, it's tangible or it's like, I think that experience of, um, having a reaction to something and you're like, why am I sweating through my clothes from that email? Right? Like (laughs) this doesn't make sense. Um, and there's a saying from somewhere that I don't know the origin, but if it's hysterical, it's historical. (laughs) Yep. <laughs> Do you know where that came from? I love that. I don't know where it came from, but I love that one. Yes. Yeah. Because it it's true, right? If we are reacting like a three-year-old in, in our in our panic of, oh my gosh, I upset dad and I need this connection to survive, right? This is that's a very life or death experience for a kid in their in their brain. If dad doesn't, if dad's upset with me, I'm not okay. You know, a three-year-old doesn't have the capacity, like you said, to be like, oh, dad's having, you know, stressed out at work and he just got this news. And it, you know, no, it's just like kids are already egocentric because that's how they see the world. And if they're not getting the explanation from the parent of like, oh, honey, you're okay. Everybody spills milk, right? Then you make the understanding. And trauma is explained in a lot of different ways, but one that really resonates for me is it's, it's less of what happened and more of what you made that mean. So like the spilled milk, it's, it's less of the spilled milk and the dad yelling and more of her, what she, what she, you know, internalized because of that. Yeah. In EMDR, we say it's not what's happening to us. It's happening. What's, what's happening in us inside. us, Right. Because it's really not the external. It's quite really what's happening inside of me in that moment. What's going on? What's coming up for me? What am I telling myself and believing about this event? Yeah. How am I processing that? Right. How am I encoding that into mean that like how I'm going to make meaning of this in the future? Yeah. Yeah. And if we're not taking the time to, to get curious about these responses that we're having to things, we're going to continue to have the response to things because it's encoded. That's the, that is the cassette that's playing when that thing happens. And we're not in charge of that unless we go back and, and do some intentional work. Right. Around that. right. And it's like, if, if we use that example of the 30 year old with her, with her employer, she could talk about that all day long. She already knows rationally, right. Yeah. That it doesn't make sense. Yeah. She already knows rationally how to talk herself out of it. It's not helping that. Right. Yeah. Because it's, it's not a part of her explicit memory or her processing. That's not what needs to work. Yes. What needs to work is the body, right? Yeah. The implicit memory and implicit is like how I've encoded it, how it feels in my body. Yeah. And that's where EMDR differs from talk therapy or mm-hmm. trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. EMDR is a somatic process. So it means we're working with the body, yeah. which we know if anything happened before the age of five, which we would call like developmental trauma, you really do need to do somatic work, yeah, right? Because we don't have the explicit narrative memory of those things that happened before we were five. Yeah. It's encoded in our body, not in our brain. Yeah. The way I talk about, cause e- EFT is similar. It's a tool. It's a somatic tool that helps us be able to move into these, these deeper places. And I talk about it as EFT is the oxygen mask. Like we're, we're holding on so tight to this analytical buoy and we want to talk about it. We want to learn more about it. We want to understand it, right? We can intellectualize and analyze, but what we really need to do is let go and go down and feel the things associated. And that's, scary. So we need a tool like tapping, like EMDR to help us be able to, to go down there safely and move some things around, reprocess, re-understand what it is 
so that you aren't just clinging to this like buoy that's not going to take you anywhere. Right. Yeah. Right. And I tell people too, like, if it's something you're interested in, learn more about it, ask questions, and then just reflect and wait until you feel ready. Yeah. EMDR isn't going anywhere. It will be available to you. So yeah. wait until you feel confident and ready. We know when we're ready to deal with things and how we're able to deal with things. You know, it's on your timeline. Yeah. Yeah. And the nuances between like, this feels, this is a hard no right now because I'm just not ready for whatever reason. And like, this feels a little expansive and I'm a little scared and I a little bit don't want to do this, but I, I'm, I'm going to like lean in because I feel resourced enough to start to explore this piece by piece. Mm -hmm. I think is also like, sometimes the ego comes in when we get presented with a opportunity to do real work and it's like, no, we're good. We're good. Like we're good. <laughs> so just getting curious, even around the decision process with yourself of, is this something that in my body feels like I'm moving toward, but it feels a little expansive versus I feel very, very like I'm pushing this away and this is not right for me and my body right now. Mm -hmm. And the only time I tell people like that there is pressure to do something is we have a recent events protocol in our wow. manual instrument. And it takes 90 days to encode an event into the memory system, into okay. the storage house. And so if you have a single event that's happened to you within 90 days, that is very disturbing, go see your EMDR therapist. Deal with it in those first 90 days because it's not it doesn't have to actually be encoded into your system as a traumatic memory, as a traumatic experience. You can help yeah. it before it's done that work. If it's after that, then take your time. Oh, that's beautiful. That's like, gives so much hope for, for things that happen. Um, and one other thing that I, I love that you said that I want to point out is like, I think sometimes people hear trauma and they think, oh, well, I wasn't raped. I I wasn't in a war zone. I didn't have someone die, right? And they're sort of like discounting that they have trauma because of those more talked about types of traumas. But like you said, it's any moment where you feel like your reaction is just not, it's not appropriate for the situation. It's it's bigger than the situation. I think that helps to destigmatize trauma in, mm -hmm. it's like, Oh, it's experience of life. We're all, we all have traumas of different varieties and significancies. Yeah. And there's like, we, we can say like, there's big T traumas, right? Yeah. Capital trauma, like globalized events. And then, and, and big significant events. And then there's little traumas, like lowercase traumas, like really that, that could be a microaggression. Like mm -hmm. those can be little things that happen over time and over and over again that, yeah, again, it's not what happened to us. It's ha what's happening inside of us. So if your body is responding to things in a certain way, it doesn't matter if no one else thinks it's trauma for yeah. you. It is. I always tell my clients like, look, you and I could go through the same thing. Yeah. You could go through it and be resilient and it doesn't matter to you. And I could have gone through it and have nightmares, flashbacks, hypervigilance, avoidance of the stimuli, right? That it yeah. is. That means I have some type of PTSD associated with it, right? Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. okay. Let me get that taken care of. It doesn't have to be the same for everyone. Yes. And this happens a lot with siblings where they'll say, like, say I have a client who has something very real for them that happened, but they're like, but the, my sister doesn't see it the same way. Or she, she always tells me that like our dad wasn't that way. So I'm, I'm like, you know, discounting what I feel in my body. And it's like your experience of your father and her experience of your father are different because of the nature that you're different people and how he reacted, he acted towards one of you is different, right? So like even siblings can go through the same parenting and come out with much, much different opinions and experiences of, of the parent. Correct. Our internal systems are different for each yeah. one of us, right? And our nervous systems are different for each yeah. one of us. Yes. So what one child is hypersensitive to another child might not be, and that's okay. Yeah. And it's looking at, does it, again, does it impair your life and your functioning? 
Yeah. Is it impairing or impacting your relationship with your father who let's say, let's just categorize and let's say he's a healthy person to have a relationship with. Well, if yeah. it's impairing that relationship and you'd like to work on it, great. Come on in. If he's not a healthy person. Okay. Then we look at how do we set boundaries there and we can still work on it, right? Just because you effectively reprocess something doesn't mean that you have to forgive the person or reconcile with the person. Like that's, those are all separate clinical things issues. Yeah. Right? This yeah. work is for us so that we can go on and live our lives the way we want, which brings me to the last part of the MDR, which is the future template. Mm. So when we finish reprocessing something and then we've installed a positive cognition, we actually set up a future template for next time, right? So let's say the 30 year old, you know, she's effectively reprocessed all these things. She's got a positive cognition. I'm good or I'm okay. And then I tell her, right, this is my favorite part of sessions is, okay, let's say your boss comes into your office and is giving you feedback. How would you like to respond next time? Yeah. Right? And she gets to choose. And then we practice that over and over with the bilateral stimulation. Mm -hmm. And then we practice it with a challenged response, right? So let's say things don't exactly go the way she wants. So basically she's got this cassette tape ready for the future events, yeah. right? It targets all that anticipatory anxiety and it allows us to be more effective in future situations too, right? So it could even be like, okay, so you have to see this toxic ex that has physically abused you many times and you have to co-parent with him. Yeah. How would you like to respond next time at drop off? And we create the future template, right? Yeah, that's beautiful. So that, that anticipatory anxiety doesn't have to be there. And our brain thinks when we are in the parking lot pulling up to exchange our kids, our brain almost believes we've already been there and knows how to yeah. respond. Right. So yeah. cool. That's, I mean, ugh, there's so many cool things about the brain, but it doesn't know if we're, if we're thinking about something or if we're experiencing something. Right. So that's why also when we future trip and feel really anxious about the future, that can be so harmful because we're already creating that as our reality and our body is experiencing that as our reality. So if I'm thinking about how nervous I am to see him at the drop-off over and over and over, it's like I've lived that a thousand times already before I even get there. And then that exact thing happens. Right. So there's so much power in the future visualization or in that, in that preparation. Also from a, just a control standpoint of wanting to feel more in control of something that feels really scary or feels really intimidating. Yeah. And like, like we've talked about, it doesn't have to be the biggest thing in the work. I world I've worked on, um, different future templates with people about job interviews, yeah. about pressing submit on an application, right? Yeah. Like it can be smaller things, but they create big stuff for us. It feels really big to us. Okay. There's no right and wrong on what you can do EMDR with and what you can't. It's also great for anxiety symptoms, panic attacks, like those kind of things as well. Yeah. Phobias, we can do it on that. We can even do, this is like super wild, but you can even do EMDR on super disturbing dreams, which is cool. wild. Yeah. That's so, so cool. There's a lot you can do with it. Yeah. Oh, I'm so happy we had this conversation. We're yeah. definitely going to have you back to talk about your work with adolescents because Margot also works <laughs> with the kiddos or I don't know, you call them kiddos when they're that age, but um, who have parents who are narcissistic. So we'll have you back on to talk about what that co-parenting situation looks like from just how to best support your child. Um, ah. but yeah, we just, <laughs> we just nerded out for I know. forever. On EMDR. <laughs> it's so fun though. It's so fun. And there's so much you can do with it. There's so many different phases of the, yeah. of the treatment and, I mean, it's so helpful. And one of the things I leave people with is that when you're deciding to EMDR or cognitive behavioral therapy or talk therapy, one piece of advice I give people is you can do in like five or six sessions or eight sessions or 10 sessions of EMDR, what you might do in a year of weekly therapy, talk yeah. therapy. So yeah. just keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, I love it. Um, Margo, I like to end these by pulling a spirit Oracle card for the listeners. So if you would like to um, help me choose a card. Oh yeah. Okay. So go ahead and close your eyes for me and just tune in, take a deep breath into the deck and just visualize me shuffling a deck. Mm -hmm. Whenever you feel like the shuffle's complete, just tell me when to stop. Okay. Stop. Okay. 
we got sharking Ooh. if you if you guys aren't watching the video it's it's a picture of two sharks that are like circling each other and i'm going to read it read the message from the book here okay one of the most ancient and revered creatures is sending you a message to move Sharking says, keep gliding in and around of relationships or conflict. This is not avoiding, but simply a way of moving into and out of experience. It's not the time to be stagnant. Stillness is not your friend right now. You need to move softly around the situation. Check it out from all angles. With a slow and measured movement, you will outlast the discomfort, drama, or conflict that surround you. No big motions are required now. An easy and continuous pace is best suited for you. Movement in the subtle body is helpful to find your rhythm. Don't get pinned down by any one person or expectation. Swim, glide, slide effortlessly, and you will find what you need. I love it. Yeah. I always love it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, like swim around it, take some data, understand it better. <laughs> yeah. 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 What good feedback for the listeners too, right? Like, just swim around what you heard today and see yeah. if anyone is like ready for the next step, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, there's very few things in life are, um, you know, need to be dealt with in a, in a super timely, yep. anxiously timely manner, <laughs> unless you've experienced something within 90 days that you want to yes, process. That's their only time frame. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Margo, where can people find you ongoing? Yes, you can find me at hollandhearttherapy.com. That's my um, therapeutic website. And then also you can follow me on Instagram. It's margo underscore LPC. So M-A-R-G-E-A-U-X underscore LPC. Awesome. And we'll link with everything in the, the show notes. Um, any last minute thing that you want to leave, leave the audience with? I can't wait to come back. This has been so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You neither, me neither. Um, for all of those listening, if this resonated for you, be sure to send it to a friend of yours. Um, like and share the podcast. It helps other women be able to find it organically too. So until next time, Margo, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.